Amen. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Apologize for the uh, connection of brother Michael, who was leading the song. Internet connection is not as powerful as issues with it. But we are happy to have brother Martin here with us. Brother Martin did a wonderful job, excellent job last night on the topic, salvation is personal. To those who are joining us today, just to say a few things about, about our speaker, let us just quickly remind what was said last night about Brother Martin. Brother Martin is from the island of Dominica, Eastern Caribbean. He was baptized in 1981 at the Vilcas Church of Christ in Dominica. He is a graduate of the Jamaica School of Preaching, 1987. Brother Martin worked as minister for the Salisbury and Scotsdale Churches of Christ on the island of Dominica, 1987 to 2000. He has been serving the Georgetown Church of Christ, Grand Cayman, since 2000. Brother Martin is married to Carol, and they have one son named Ron. Martin is well known among churches of Christ in the Caribbean. He is knowledgeable in the scriptures, sound in faith and doctrine. He is an able preacher and a teacher of the scriptures. It is a pleasure to have him share with us in four nights of preaching on the theme, Salvation Has Come. Therefore, we welcome Brother Martin here with us today. Thank you so much, Brother Roy, for another evening's introduction. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, friends, uh, those of you who are joining us for the second night, or those of you who may be joining us for us to uh, joining us tonight, sorry, uh, for the first time, we want you to know that we are very uh, encouraged. We are very glad. We are inspired that you can join us for this evening's meeting. Uh, tonight, as Brother Roy pointed out in the introduction, is our second night as we attempt to have a series of gospel meetings, and we are doing so under the theme that salvation has come to your house. And so that's the main theme that we will be examining in this series of lessons. Uh, we want, before we get into our lessons this, into our lesson this evening, uh, to thank all those of you who prayed and interceded to God on our behalf in terms of the tropical storm or hurricane Ian. We are confident that God has heard your prayers and many intercessions, and he has responded to them positively. And so we want you to know that uh, we have gone through that time period uh, relatively unscathed. There is very little report of any damage, no loss of life. And um, generally, we have come through uh, this storm in what, if you want to use that expression, uh, in flying colors. So we believe that God is at work, that he is in control, and that he is wonderful. And I know that in, in, in some um, of the weather reports, you might have heard that Cayman was being pounded, uh, but sometimes what is seen on the satellite and what is the reality on the ground might be a little bit different. And so we had minor winds and some rainfall, but nothing um, um, significant. Uh, we feared for the worst, but God has given us the best. And so we are thankful for your prayers. We are thankful for your thoughtfulness. We are thankful for those of you uh, who called in or sent messages and inquired about our well-being and the well-being of those in the Cayman Islands during this time. So a happy thank you to everybody. And so last night under the theme, um, Salvation Has Come to Your House, we talked about the importance of making salvation personal. And we tried to define that. We tried to explain that. And we said that making salvation personal means that each one of us need to have a vested interest or express interest in our own salvation. And we must be prepared to bear the responsibility that comes with working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. 
or as Peter calls it, we are to be diligent, vigilant, vigilant to make our calling and our election sure. And so we gave you a number of reasons last evening why we needed to make salvation personal. We discovered such things as sin being personal, that the consequences of sin was personal, that the judgment for sin will be personal, that the provisions of for salvation made by Jesus Christ was personal, that the call to salvation is personal, and therefore our response must be personal, it must be individual. And we looked at the example of Zacchaeus, uh, how he sought Jesus and how Jesus um, recognized him, singled him out as an individual and called him and declared to him, today salvation has come to your house for you too, you are a son of Abraham. In this evening's lesson, we want to talk about the cost of salvation, the cost of salvation. And as we think about this topic, it raises certain questions in our minds. And we, we are forced to ask ourselves, is there a cost to salvation? And if there is, what is that cost really like? Another question we might be asking is, why would somebody even dare talk about the cost of salvation? Is that relevant? Is that important for my life? Is that important for your life? Well, I would like to begin by reminding us uh, that the concept of cost is of extreme importance in life. In fact, everything in life comes at a cost. Everything in life comes with a price tag attached to it. And sometimes even things that are promised to us as being free, they too come with a cost. And so sometimes you might hear the advertisement that says, buy one, get one free. And in reality, most times you are paying for two because <laughs> the one that they tell you is free is absorbed in the cost of the one that you are paying for. Uh, recently, I had an experience like that. I was looking at the messages in my phone and I saw a message that told me that I could get $10 of free credit. And normally I don't pay attention to these things, but I told myself, I'm going to try to see if these people are really sincere and genuine because I'd like to have $10 of free credit on my phone. So I pressed on the link and I began to follow all of the instructions. And then it takes me to a page that tells me in essence uh, that I cannot have this credit today because there are terms and conditions that apply and I do not meet those terms and conditions. Of course, you can well imagine how frustrated and disappointed I was but I was able to confirm uh, that, you know, sometimes things that people tell you are free are not really free because there are TLCs that are attached to those things. And just like everything else that is in life comes with a cost, then salvation also comes with a cost and it comes with a price as well. And we will be discussing what that cost or what that price is like. But before we do that, I want to again remind us that the concept of cost is important because the cost or the value that we place on something or on someone will determine our attitude or our approach to that thing or to that person. And so if there is something that is of great value to me, then I have a lot of interest in it. I will do all in my power to have it or obtain it. I will do all in my power to safeguard it and to cherish it because it is something there to me. I know tonight that many of us 
especially those of us who are women, we have some jewelry box hidden somewhere. Most of us have a safety deposit box somewhere. And in that little safety deposit book, we have some of our most valued items or pieces of treasure. And for some of us, they might be rings and, and, and chains. For some of us, they might be, be coins, but, but those are things that are worth a lot to us. There are sometimes things we have that are of sentimental value, something that your great, great, great grandmother left you and it has passed through the family and it is now with you. And even if it might not be have a great um, um, dollar amount of value attached to it, but it has great sentimental value. And so you have it deposited there in your safety deposit box. And in times like of storm, like those we are experiencing, one of the first things you do is that you save and you secure your valuables that are in case anything happens in the midst of the storm, that you have them ready. They are close to you and that you can run away with them. So remember that our, that, that the value we place on things, the cost that we place on things will determine whether we have a positive attitude towards such things or whether we have a negative attitude towards those things. I want us to remember that even Jesus himself reminds us of the importance of cost and especially as it relates to salvation. He encourages us to count the cost when it comes to salvation. And he gives us the story or the illustration of a man who decided that he was going to build a tower, but that he did not count the cost first. And so when he got into the, the building of the tower, he fell into great difficulties and he was not able to complete the structure. And that those who passed by laughed and mocked and jeered about him. And they said of this man in Luke chapter 14, he began to build this massive structure and he was not able to finish it. And so cost as it relates to salvation is of extreme importance to you and to me. So having said that, I want to share with you a passage from 1 Peter chapter 1. And verses 3 through 21, which will help us tonight to be able to reflect on whether salvation has a cost. And if it does, then what is the cost like? And so listen carefully to these words spoken by the Apostle Peter. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, notice, for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, he says, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little season, if needs be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Notice in verse 9, he says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Then he's going to give us some details about that salvation we will receive at the end of time through Christ. He says, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired, and they have searched carefully or diligently, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you and to me. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and of the glories that would follow. To them it was not revealed, not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which we now have been reported to you 
through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from, sent from heaven. Things, he says, which angels desire to look into. Therefore, he says, gird up the lines of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former loss as in your ignorance, but as he who call you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear. And get this now, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your father but rather you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without sport. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. What a great and powerful passage of scripture. As Peter tells us about the greatness of our salvation, as he tells us about the unfolding process by which salvation comes to us, and as he tells us about the magnificent, the awesome price that was paid in order that we might receive that salvation. And Peter encourages us and reminds us that though sometimes in this life we may have struggles and trials, but in view of that great salvation that awaits us, we should endure through the trials of this life because the time will come when we will rejoice with joy unspeakable when we enter the very presence of God in heaven itself. And so he tells us how in the unfolding of this salvation that God gave the Old Testament prophets to provide us with instructions and directing that salvation. And that as they did so, as they preached, as the Isaiahs and the Jeremiah spoke about the salvation we would later receive in Christ. They did not understand the fullness of what they were preaching. And so they searched and they tried to understand, but they couldn't. And the Bible tells us not just the prophets, but even the angels of God who helped in the deliverance of the message. They too were peering into the things that were being recorded by the prophets through inspiration, trying to understand the fullness of that mystery. But to them, the scripture tells us it was not revealed. Rather, it was revealed to us through the holy apostle and prophets of Jesus Christ. And then he urges us that we need to realize that our salvation came at a great price, at a great cost, and therefore we must cherish it. And so he calls upon us to be holy as our Lord is holy. And he gives us the reason for it. He tells us that when we were redeemed, when we were purchased, when we were saved, when the purchase price, when the redemptive price for our salvation was laid down, it was not laid down with corruptible things, things that are subject to decay, things that are subject to corruption, things that do not last forever. But he reminds us that when we were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Notice further, he tells us that Christ did not come by chance. He did not come by accident, but he was as a lamb that was slain in the mind of God from the foundations of the world. And so it took a lot of time. It took a lot of effort. It took a lot of energy. It took a lot of sacrifice, my friends, for the salvation we are called to, the salvation we are to enjoy in Jesus Christ, it took a lot for us to receive that salvation. 
And so as we talk tonight about the cost of salvation, I want us to first of all recognize that salvation came to us at an awesome cost, that it has a great cost, a great price that is involved in our salvation. That salvation did not come to us cheaply. When we think of the text, it tells us that salvation was not brought, bought by things like silver and gold. And when we think of silver and gold, these are some of the most uh, precious and the most priceless metals from the ancient of days, even unto this present day that we are living in, uh, that people continue to value their riches, they continue to value uh, their treasure uh, as they measure it against silver and gold. When we purchase certain items in our lives, items of jewelry, they are usually in silver and gold because there is weight and there is worth to that. But the scripture wants us to know uh, that the price paid for our salvation was greater than all of that, that we were not redeemed with those kinds of things, but rather we were redeemed with the blood of Christ. And so I want to say to you tonight as we talk about the awesome cost of salvation that when you think about salvation when you think about the way that salvation came to us and the price that was involved that we need to understand that salvation doesn't cost god his only begotten son and the word only begotten tells us that jesus christ was one of a kind he was the only one who was really worthy of being known or being called uh, the true son of God. The one who was born of the loins of the father who is in heaven. And though we are sons of God like Jesus was, yet there are, uh, is a great distinction in which we are sons of God. Because you and I were once bastards. We were illegitimate children, but through a process called adoption, God has taken us into his family. But, but Jesus is not adopted. He is born. He is the immediate descendant of God the Father. He shares the likeness of the Father. He shares the fullness of the Father. And yet still, when the time came, the Bible tells us that God in the fullness of time gave, sent forth his son, born of a woman. And he was born under the law and he was sent to redeem those of us who were under the law. In John chapter 3 and verse number 16, we read that passage last night. It's a well-known verse of scripture. The scripture reminds us that God so loved, he loved the world beyond measure, beyond degree, that he gave his one and only begotten son, the son of his love, the son of his loins. He gave that son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And the scripture goes on to tell us that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him, he who believes not in him is condemned, but he who believes in him will be saved. And so God sent Christ in the fullness of time, to die for your sins and for mine. Paul tells us the same thing in the book of Romans chapter 5 and from verse 1 through 9. Listen to Paul as he speaks to us. He says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we all have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces for us the concept of hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been shared or poured abroad like a drink offering into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us for confirmation. For when we were still without strength, the Bible tells us in due time Christ died for the ungodly. 
For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. And then he tells us in verse 8 that God demonstrated, God portrayed, God manifested, God showed his love towards us as humanity. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the scripture goes on to say that if when we were the enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so the Bible tells us that God out of love sent his only begotten son to die in our stead to die for our sins why because the wages of sin is death and the persons who de who deserved to have been hanging on the cross are the sinners you and i he was the spotless sinless son of god and yet god sent him into the world to die for our sins I like what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. It is one of my favorite passages in script of Scripture. It is so in-depth. It is so profound. It is so powerful. Uh, where, 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 where Paul says this, he says that God the Father made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us in our place, in our stead, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Can you imagine that? God took his son and sent him into the world. And though he lived a sinless life, he allowed his son to become sin, to become dirty, to become the sin offering and allowed him to die in our stead. And we have a transaction taking place where our sins were projected on Christ and the righteousness of God, which is in Christ, was transferred to you and to me. What a trade-off. What a blessing that we have in God. And then I want to follow that up and share with you that salvation came at an awesome cost, not only to God, the Father, who had to sacrifice his only son, but it came at a great cost because the son had to give his life for our salvation. His son gave everything that he had. He had one life. He didn't have nine lives like they say a cat has. He had a single life. He did everything that was right in that life. And yet still when the time came, the son was willing to lay down his life so that you and I could be saved. And so the Bible tells us in John chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, that greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. And he goes on to tell us that we are his friends if we keep his commandments, if we do whatever he tells us to do. Yes, greater love. There has never been a greater portrayal of love in the world than an individual who is willing to pay the ultimate price, to sacrifice himself or to sacrifice herself and pay the sin debt for sinners, for vile sinners like you and I, that we could be redeemed. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 9, the apostle Paul used the concept of Christ giving his life for us to encourage believers to see the need to be able to give and to sacrifice and to contribute in the service of God. And so writing to the members of the church at Corinth, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 8, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy, their deep poverty abounded to the riches of their liberality. For he testifies, for I bear them witness, that according to their ability, yes, and even beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the minister into the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. 
And so we urge Titus, as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you are bound in everything, as you are bound in faith, as you are bound in speech, as you are bound in knowledge, as you are bound in diligence and in your love for us as human beings, he is saying, see that you are bound in this grace also. And the grace of which he speaks is the grace of giving that he wants the Corinthians to imitate the example of the Macedonians in being willing to sacrifice into the giving uh, for the necessity of the saints and of the church. And then he provides them in verses 8 and 9 with the motivation, the reason why they should be willing to contribute and to give. He says, I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For he says, for you know, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Another passage similar to 2 Corinthians 5.21 where we just examined, the scripture says that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here Paul paints an even more graphic picture of the reality of that truth. And so he tells us that Jesus Christ, although he was rich, and I want to pause and comment here and, and, and give you a little understanding here. Because when the Bible says that Jesus Christ was rich, what it really means is that he was rotten rich. He was what we call filthy rich. He was abundantly rich. And though he was abundantly rich and wealthy, the Bible says, yet for our sakes, for our sins sake, he became poor. And I want you to know that the word poor here is the very opposite of filthy rich, of rotten rich. It means dirt poor, where you are at the lowest of the lowest scales of life and for society. That you are empty handed, that you really have nothing. You, you, you have nothing to the point that you are really graveling in the dirt. So Jesus was filthy rich, and for your sake and mine, he became dirt poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. See that transformation, see that transaction that takes place, how Jesus Christ empties himself of his wealth. He becomes poor in our place, and then he takes his riches and he places it upon us who are dirt poor so that we on account of his poverty abound in riches so we are now no longer dirt poor we are now rotten rich filthy rich we are now abundantly rich in jesus christ and friends you know what is amazing about the fact of Jesus giving his life is the fact that he did it voluntarily. He did it willingly. And he testified to that in John chapter 10, where he reminds us that he is the good shepherd, not a hireling, but the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And he reminds us that he lays down his life freely, that he can take it up again that no one took his life from him. He was not forced to give his life. Nobody held a, a, a gun at his head and, and said, you better do it or I'll take your life. He was not forced. He was not coerced. He voluntarily, he willingly went to the cross and he died there for your sin and for my sin. He resigned himself to the will of the Father, and he died in our place. Oh, what a wonderful sacrifice Jesus, the Son of God, has made for us. There is a song that reminds us that there was one who was willing to die in my stead, that a soul so unworthy might live. 
and the path to the cross, he was tread all my sins to forgive. And the song reminds us, they are nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. Jesus suffered what anguish and loss he experienced on the cross. All my sins there to carry with him on the cross. Oh, how much he suffered. Isaiah paints a picture of the pain, of the agony of the Savior. Reminds us how he was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. One in whom there was no beauty or comeliness to the extent that when we saw him, he would be so disfigured, he would be so ugly that there would be no beauty in him, that we would even desire him, that we would even want to be with him. And so painful was the picture of the cross that when Jesus was on the cross, he had to cry out to his father in heaven and say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back? on your only son that you love so much. And it all happened because of your sin. It all happened because of my sin. Another song says, oh, listen to our wondrous story, counted once among the lost, yet one came down from heaven's glory, saving us at awful cost. No angel could his place have taken, highest of the high though he, the loved one on the cross forsaken was one of the Godhead free. Will you surrender to the Savior, to his scepter, humbly bow? You too shall come to know his favor. He will save you and he will save you now. And the refrain of the song asks, who saved us from eternal loss? Who but God's son upon the cross? What did he do? He died for you. Where is he now? He is still in heaven, and he's so concerned about your soul, soul salvation that he is interceding and he's pleading with the heavenly father for you right now. Another song reminds us of Jesus Christ, that he paid a debt he did not owe. We owed a debt we could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away, and now I sing a brand new song amazing grace all day long christ jesus paid the debt i could never pay he paid the debt at calvary he cleansed my soul and he set me free i'm glad that jesus did all my sins erase i now can sing a brand new song amazing grace all day long christ jesus paid the debt i could never pay Another song reminds us that Jesus says, I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be and quickened from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? That song reminds us of the greatness of the sacrifice of Christ. My father's house of light, my glory circled throne. I left for earthly light. I left for wandering, sad, and lone. And the song says, I left, I left it all for thee. Has thou left aught for me? Is the question that God is asking of us this morning. And so I want you to know today that salvation came at an awesome price. It cost God his only begotten son. It cost God's son his only life that he had and yet my friends in a very paradoxical way salvation is given to us for free can you believe it can you believe that something that fetches such a great price such an awesome price and yet still when it comes to your part and my part when it comes to receiving the gift of salvation god gives it to us freely we just have to reach out and receive it and take hold of it and so the prophet isaiah says to the people of his day "Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts come to the waters and you who have no money 
come and buy and eat. Yes, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me here and your soul will live. He goes on to say, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and the Lord will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. For as far as the heavens are high above the earth, so are God's ways higher than my ways and your ways and God's thoughts higher than your thoughts and my thoughts. And while we may not comprehend the mystery of salvation, while we may not comprehend the sacrifice of salvation, God and Christ have made the sacrifice on our behalf. God gave the best. He gave his son. His son gave the best. He gave his life. And through the giving of God's son and through the giving of the life of Jesus Christ on the cross, you and I can have today redemption and salvation. We can have forgiveness of sin in great abundance. But then we want to ask the question as we close today, that even if salvation has come to us at a great price on the part of God and Christ, and even if it is being offered to us for free, the question is, what price are you willing to pay? There is something in, in life that says that like must demand like. That if one loves you, it demands that you love them in return. That if one sacrifices for you, it demands that you be willing to sacrifice for that person in return. That if one treats you with kindness, that it should just be obvious that you respond in a similar fashion and you treat that person with kindness. You and I ought to be willing to pay any price. We ought to be willing to pay the utmost price. We ought to be willing to pay even the price of laying down our lives for the sake of Jesus Christ, considering the awesome cost of the salvation that we have received. No wonder the apostle Paul in Acts 20, chapter 20, when he was uh, being discouraged and told, if you go to Jerusalem and you will be killed there, he says, I do not count my life there to myself and none of these things move me. In another place, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain with Jesus Christ. Therefore, Paul says, I have counted all things but loss that I might gain the excellency and the blessings and the privileges that are in Christ Jesus. Last night we talked about the story of Zacchaeus and we saw how that when Zacchaeus came to Jesus, when he came to know the Savior, he was willing to part with some of his goods and possessions that he had obtained in an ill legal manner and he was willing to make restitution in order that he could receive the salvation that god offers but let me share with you this story from scripture a story that should help you and i to gauge our response and great gauge our attitude towards the awesome cost the awesome price that was paid for our redemption and salvation the scripture tells us in mac chapter 10 beginning at verse number 17 now I as he, Jesus, was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? There is no good, there is no one good but one, and that is God. Do you know the commandments? Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not be a false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother, etc., etc., and he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things have I kept from my youth. And in some translation, it would say, what do I still need? 
And Jesus, in verse 21, the Bible says, Jesus looked at him, and Jesus had love and mercy and pity and compassion on him and said to him, there is just one thing that you are lacking. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, he says, and take up your cross and follow me. And I want you to look at this young man's reaction. I want you to think of your reaction to the salvation that Jesus has brought to you this evening. But he was sad at this word and he went away sorrowful or grew, or, or, so he went away sorrowful or grieved or he went away heavy hearted. And the Bible gives us the reason because he had great possessions. And so this man came to the door of salvation. He ran to the savior. He knelt before the Savior. He acknowledged the greatness of the, of the Savior. He asks life's most important question. Good master, what shall I do to have eternal life? He was told about the commandments. He said that he had been obedient to the commandments of the law of Moses. And he was told there is just one thing. If you will just part with some of your possessions and, and give to those who are in need and take up your cross, the cross of pain and suffering, the willingness to endure through trials and hardship, Jesus says to him, you will have eternal life. And he came so close, but yet he was so far away. He came to the door of salvation. He came to the door of life eternal, but he turned away from the door and he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Are you like that this evening? Have you journeyed in the direction of Christ? Have you come close to Christ? But there is this one thing that you will not give up. There is this person in your life that you will not part with. Uh, there is this treasure in your life that you will not part with. There is this habit in your life. It's a bad habit. You know it's a bad habit. You know it's ruining your life, but yet still you cling on to it. You will not let go. You will keep holding. It will drown you. You will die with it, but you will not part with it simply so that you can have the salvation that is in Christ. And Jesus said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Not impossible, but difficult. And the disciples were astonished at his word. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men, it is impossible. But with God, for with God, all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to him, Lord, we have left everything and we have followed you. We've left our homes. We've left our families. We've left our jobs, our occupation. And I hear Peter asking Jesus, Lord, what is in it for us? Now that we have left everything for you, what benefits are we going to get or obtain in having forsaken all our earthly possessions for you? And find some assurance in the words of Jesus tonight. For he says, as shortly I say to you, that there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children, or lands, for my name's sake and the gospels. Who, notice, will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, of course. And in the age to come, you will get the bonus of life eternal. For many who are first will be last, and the last will be for us. Friends, as we close tonight, I want you to know that sal salvation is not cheap, that it came to us at great cost, that it cost God his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. It cost God's son, Jesus Christ, the only life that he had. He poured out his lifeblood for our salvation. And yet still, salvation is not given to us for a sum of money. 
It is not given to us for some great feat that we can accomplish in life, like swimming across the Atlantic Ocean in, in shark-infested waters. We don't have to do anything like that. It's given to us freely. We can have it without money in our pockets. You can be broke tonight, but like Lazarus, you can be rich in Christ. You can have salvation. Bearing in mind the awesome cost of your salvation, what price are you willing to pay to receive it and to keep it? I think we must be willing to do anything and we must be prepared to do everything possible in our power to ensure that we secure the salvation that God offers to us in Jesus Christ. We must be even willing to pay the ultimate price. And that is, if it calls for us to lay down our lives on the altar to receive the salvation of Christ, we should be able to say, so be it. And so the Apostle Paul exhorts us in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, and he tells us, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep from us. Because if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and act of disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first was spoken to us by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him? God giving confirmation and witness by various signs and wonders. I ask you tonight, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Let us close tonight with the words of this song that helps us to reflect on the price that was paid, on the debt that we owe, and on the must be willing to pay. And the songwriter says this, he says, when this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when we stand with Christ on high, looking over life's history, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty, not my own, not yours, it's borrowed. It's a beauty that you have received from Christ. And I always comment when I read the lines of this song that there are so many people in the world today who are dressed in beauty that is not theirs because your fingernails are not yours. Your eyelashes are not yours. The hair on your head is not yours. The color of your face is not yours. Everything has been bleached and dyed and powder, and so you are dressed in a beauty that belongs to somebody else. And so the scripture tells us, finally we'll stand before the throne of God. We'll be dressed in a beauty, not our own. We'll be dressed in the robes of Christ. When I see thee as thou art, and love thee with an unseen in heart, then Lord will I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When the praise of heaven I hear, Loud as thunders to the air, loud as many waters noise, sweet as harps, melodious voice. Then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. And pay attention to the last verse, because it closes that song with beauty. It says, even on earth as through a glass, darkly let thy glories pass. Make forgiveness feel so sweet to me. Make your spirit's help so meet to me. And look at the last line. Even on earth, Lord, make me know something of how much I owe. We may not understand the depths or the amount of all that we owe God. But one thing is sure, my dear friends. One thing is sure, my brothers and sisters in Christ. One thing is sure that salvation came to us at an awesome cost, at an awesome price. It's given to us freely. And you and I should be willing to pay whatever price it takes to secure that salvation for ourselves. God bless you. It was a pleasure having you visiting our YouTube channel today. I hope that 
it was a spiritual blessing to your life and challenging to you. This YouTube channel has been a blessing to thousands of people. If you are blessed and you are interested in getting in touch with us, you can call us at telephone number 780-902-1329. Again, I repeat this number, 780-902-1329. Or you can email us at this email address, southedmonton.churchofchrist at gmail.com. Again, I repeat our email address, southedmonton.churchofchrist at gmail.com. I am Roy Grano saying to you, go out and make it a great day for the Lord.